Chapter twenty eight of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. Bulgaria and its King. Since I came to Sofia, I have had the honor of an audience with His Majesty, Boris the Third, who is now the Tsar or King of Bulgaria. He is a constitutional monarch, having powers somewhat similar to those of the King of England. He is also an hereditary ruler his father ferdinand having been made the first king of the bulgars the principality of bulgaria was created forty odd years ago by the treaty of berlin through which the country became self-governing though it had to pay tribute to the sultan of turkey it was decreed that a prince should be elected by the people and confirmed by the sultan with the consent of the powers at last in nineteen o eight bulgaria declared its independence of turkey and prince ferdinand was placed on the throne ferdinand was naturally a fighter he was in close alliance with the germans and brought in german officers to aid in the organization of his army it was largely through his influence that bulgaria sided with the kaiser during the war although the sympathies of most of the people were with the allies in the last days of the war ferdinand had to abdicate and he fled to vienna where he consoled himself with a third wife a brazilian heiress boris the third then twenty-seven years of age came to the throne on october third nineteen eighteen the people like him for his democratic ways he goes about sophia like an ordinary citizen dressed in everyday business clothes in striking contrast with kaiser wilhelm his father's friend who loved to strut around in the gorgeous outfit of a general and sometimes changed his uniforms a dozen times in one day king boris seldom wears military dress he shakes hands with his friends when he meets them and may stop and chat indeed he is so unpretentious that his father who liked to wrap himself in the divinity that doth hedge a king often reproved him for his democratic ways and now and then referred to him as that peasant his majesty has as royal blood in his veins as any monarch in europe for he is a great-grandson of louis philippe of france but he has had the good sense to adapt himself to his situation which is that of the ruler of a peasant democracy he is a man of fine education with a scientific bent as well as a mechanical turn of mind he sometimes drives his own automobile and he so well understands the operation of a railway locomotive that on his trips through his country he often leaves the royal coach for the cab of the engine and runs the train for miles the other day he was going to Vidin, one of the towns on the danube he was in the cab with his hand on the levers and had brought the train to a stop at a station where a great crowd had gathered to meet him they kept on cheering him until he stood up in the blue denim of a locomotive engineer and made them a speech at Viden, where he boarded a little steamer for the other side of the Danube, he went into the pilot house and took the wheel, guiding the ship up the Danube to its destination and then back to Viden. The people liked Boris for his conduct during the war. He is the hero of their army, for he went out with the soldiers and slept in the trenches and was a number of times under fire. He is thoroughly interested in everything connected with the advancement of the country particularly in the new athletic movement he is honorary president of the national athletic association and has made football a national game my audience with his majesty was fixed for eleven o'clock in the morning at the royal palace in sophia this is a large yellow building in the centre of the city surrounded by a beautiful garden a three-minute walk from the door of my hotel brought me to the gates passing the soldiers stationed there i entered the palace here i was met by the master of the king's household and introduced to one of his aides who led me to a big salon on the second floor this reception room was decorated with arms of every description including a miniature machine gun mounted on a table oil paintings of the two russian czars who helped so much to give bulgaria its independence looked down upon me and a portrait of old king ferdinand occupied a prominent place I had waited only five minutes when the aide led me into another salon where a lithe, dark-faced young man rose 
and came toward me it was boris king of bulgaria he was dressed in a light pepper and salt business suit of a good cut he wore a stiff collar with a gray knit tie in which was a small ruby encircled with diamonds his majesty gave me his hand and we sat down and chatted for some time together i am not at liberty to quote what he said but i can say that his talk was full of good common-sense views on conditions in this part of the world and of friendliness and gratitude to the american people for their aid to bulgaria in settling matters after the war he said he would like much to go to america and that his father king ferdinand had felt strongly inclined to accept the invitation he received to attend the opening of the panama canal at the close of the audience i walked with his majesty down to the rear of the palace where my photographer made a snapshot of the king and who are the bulgarians the subjects of this constitutional monarch he governs a nation of five million people the descendants of slavic tribes which centuries ago settled here in the balkans they are a sturdy sober and hard-working folk who are also proud and warlike for they have imbibed the spirit of liberty from the air of the mountains in which they live though for hundreds of years they were oppressed by the turks they always fought against their rulers and kept alive their desire for freedom in their communities the people insist on managing local affairs and every little town elects its own officials even the school teachers are elected and may be dismissed at any time by popular vote considering that less than fifty years ago they had practically no schools at all the bulgarians are well educated in the days of the turkish domination not more than one man in five in the cities could read and write and nearly all the country people were illiterate eighty-five out of every one hundred of the population can now read and write notwithstanding the fact that there are something like six hundred thousand turks most of whom study only the koran in eighteen seventy eight when the treaty of berlin was signed there was only one school in the whole country that could be called an academy or high school there are now more than six hundred and the number of elementary schools is above five thousand there are about as many girls as boys among the eight thousand students in the two universities at sofia dr kisimov of the state department tells me that the bulgarian peasant will make almost any sacrifice to keep his children in school and that he will even sell his farm in order that they may start life with a better equipment than he was able to get despite the losses of the world war and the financial depression following it new schools have been started and there are thirteen institutions for training teachers dr kisimov is a graduate of robert college a former representative of his country at odessa and moscow and a man of wide experience in the courts of europe said he i would like to have the united states know the truth about our people more than eighty five per cent of whom belong to the peasant class the bulgarian has good traits and bad ones among his good qualities are his great love of education and his desire to better himself and his family he is careful and thrifty he is a landholder and he prides himself on owning his farm he is not ashamed of his condition and he is independent and honest on the other hand the bulgarian is very distrustful of others continued dr kisimov his psychology is largely due to his having been for five centuries under the turks with oppression and even massacre always hanging over him this has made him afraid of the future so that no matter how bright the sky today he fears it will be dark tomorrow if a mother sees her children laughing and having a good time she begs them not to enjoy themselves so much lest something disastrous befall in fact the peasant looks upon life as a burden his attitude reminds me of a hymn sung in some of your churches i cannot quote it correctly but it goes something like this a little more trouble a few more fears a few more sobs and a few more tears we are almost home the bulgarians are essentially pious i have visited a number of their gorgeous churches and have usually found them full these people belong to the great class of orthodox christians of whom we know comparatively little of the six hundred millions 
or one-third of the whole human family who actually are or pretend to be followers of jesus one in every four belongs to the orthodox church the others are roman catholics or protestants this faith was long known as the greek orthodox catholic church so named from the branch that broke away from roman catholicism during the strife between the eastern and the western empires of rome then these orthodox people threw off the rule of the pope and decided to flock by themselves the first split occurred more than a thousand years ago the trouble continued until the two bodies became separate churches each with its own rules of faith the greek church recognizes the guidance of the bible and in common with the roman catholics holds to the doctrines of the seven sacraments the celebration of the mass and the veneration of the virgin mary and of the saints the images and the relics it believes in fasting and has its monasteries and nunneries on the other hand it acknowledges the authority of the ecumenical council instead of the leadership of the pope and administers the lord's supper in both bread and wine although it denies the existence of purgatory it encourages prayers for the dead that god may have mercy upon them at the last judgment it accepts married priests though they must not marry after they have taken holy orders the orthodox catholics have only one mass a day and that before the rising of the sun until recently the sermon was not considered important i have talked with the archbishop of sophia his holiness monsignor stefan one of the chief ecclesiastical dignitaries of bulgaria in times past the whole orthodox church was under the greek patriarch at constantinople but he seems to have lost prestige by mixing politics with his religion and in time the various orthodox countries established independent organizations of their own such as the synod of russia and other church councils the church has been so divided that now the greeks are practically the only people that actually acknowledge the supremacy of his all holiness the patriarch of constantinople the church here does not like to be called greek orthodox its members say it is the bulgarian orthodox catholic church and i find that the same prejudices and divisions exist in serbia albania rumania and russia archbishop stefan is one of the leading christians of this part of the world he is tall and fine-looking and wears a long black gown of the finest grosgrain silk his high black hat makes him look taller and sets off his handsome intellectual face when i talked with him he wore a heavy gold chain around his neck upon which there hung a medallion the size of your hand surrounded by a band of diamonds some of them as big as peas at the top were five great amethysts and in the center was a miniature depicting christ on the cross his holiness received me in the archbishop's palace and after drinking a little cup of coffee made turkish style as hot as tophet and as thick as molasses we talked for a while about the church universal the archbishop spoke in a low tone gesturing now and then with his right hand about the wrist of which a rosary of big black beads was tightly wrapped upon leaving i begged the archbishop to write me a few lines as a message to the united states he did so and his letter now lies before me it reads i believe that america is destined to become the universal apostle for the unification of christendom for the realization of international brotherhood and for the establishment of everlasting justice and peace among the nations the human race must form one family of which the head shall be christ the last word to be uttered to the world has been entrusted to america and america must utter it it is harmony brotherhood and peace among the nations as the children of one heavenly father the first achievement of this all-american message must be the termination of bolshevism which is a denial alike of freedom and of humanity under the blessed starry banner of the united states must rally every force of constructiveness honor and idealism the world over in order that the kingdom of god on earth may come soon this letter is signed stefan archbishop of sophia 
with a cross before and after the name. End of section 28